Hello, folks. Adam Lippin here. How you doing? So anyway, here's an interesting question. Um, this is, does not rarely happen. But the question is, when is it a good idea to do a freedom of information request on your IRS audit? And um, I've recently had two different client cases where this became an issue, so I'm a little bit aware of this, so I thought I'd share it with you. So first off, what is a Freedom of Information Act request? So basically, a Freedom of Information request is something that the government, whenever they have information about you, they must disclose that information about you to you. And so let's just say, so I recently had one IRS audit that literally just finished up. I'm really happy about it. And it went like this. Essentially, this was a very complicated case that was, uh, the, IRA, the taxpayer took a very interesting position, controversial. It's one of those things that the IRS has not come out publicly against it because they don't want anybody to do it. So what they're doing is they're just going after everyone who's doing it and auditing everybody. So it's kind of like put this one guy out of business. Um, kind of interesting strategic approach. But anyway, in the course of the audit, we wanted to know what the IRS was thinking internally on their end. And so what happens when you do a Freedom of Information Act request, it will give you all of the information and all the people that have been looped in on a certain situation. So if you're kind of curious or you got an IRS audit that involves complex issues, and it involves multiple people, and it involves positions that the IRS doesn't want to share, or if they're experimenting, if they don't know. Um, again, in certain situations, the IRS, what they'll do is they'll, they'll, let's say it's one particular transaction that they've identified as questionable. <clears throat> and then what they'll do is they'll audit a bunch of people, they'll go after a bunch of people, and with each person, they will try a different tactic and approach. And then what they'll do is they'll find out what works, once they find a legal strategy that is effective, that does work, then they'll audit everybody else and they'll go with that one strategy, which, you know, that kind of makes sense. Actually, I think it's a smart tactic. It's much more efficient and effective to do it that way. So I, in that respect, I get it. However, sometimes you don't know what the IRS position is. So, for example, in this one audit that I just concluded, <clears throat> they said that a particular transaction failed. And then I'm like, I asked the auditor, why did it fail? because it failed. I'm like, okay, so why did it fail? You know, give me a little IRC, give me a little precedent. And he's like, Adam, it failed because it failed. <laughs> it's like, okay, so when a person's like, it failed because it failed, basically they don't want to share the reason why <clears throat> something failed. Let me give you a little background on that one. Let's just say that you have an aggressive position and it goes to tax court. What will happen at tax court, the judge will issue a ruling and they'll say why something <clears throat> failed or succeeded. More importantly, let's say it did fail, it'll say why it failed. Some judges will say, had the taxpayer done this differently, it would have worked. <clears throat> and so basically, as a student who likes to study, you know, tax court opinions and what goes down essentially is you say, ha, huh, it failed because they didn't do X, Y, Z. And the judge said, had they done X, Y, Z, it would have worked. So then what you do is you go to that same transaction, you update it, to make it work. <clears throat> That's when a lot of these cases, the, I, the IRS does not like a lot of these more interesting cases to go public because essentially it gives a playbook on how to get around a certain thing. And again, I understand that. So anyway, we're going through this audit and it became very clear that the IRS auditors didn't want to share what was going on. So we did a Freedom of Information Act to see kind of what the behind players were. What was interesting is once we made the request, the IRS came back with us with a very favorable ruling, so we wound up accepting a deal. So we wound up avoiding tax court appeals and all this stuff because the IRS gave us a deal that was pretty good. And I'm very pleased with it. <clears throat> and it's because we're like, hey, if you want to go to tax court, if you want to go to appeals, you know, we're going to find out what's going on. So again, if you have a complicated case and the IRS is not being very clear about what their position is, this will help do it. Another reason to do a Freedom of Information Act request <clears throat> is in the issue of penalty, IRS penalty abatement. There are some penalties, there's a recent court case, that in order for the penalty to be good, it must be approved. Oh man, I forgot what the rule is. It's like a territory advisor, a group advisor. It's not a group manager, it's like somebody a little bit higher up. Essentially, essentially, 
this is a case where it never gets done. They never, you know, I mean, can you imagine some manager actually having to sign each and every one of these? It would just be a waste of their time. <clears throat> and it was a court case on this one. So essentially, you can use this as a way to abate penalties. So again, it's definitely something, you know, just to have in your repertoire. I think it's important. And yeah, give it a shot.